Throughout our history, the Tories have been shapeshifters, adapting and evolving in order to survive and to thrive. It's that which has made them the most successful electoral force in the Western world. But if there's one consistent thread which runs through the entire history of the Conservative Party, it is this. That they are class warriors. That they are champions for the privileged interests who fund them and who they exist to champion and to represent. Following the COVID-19 crisis, in which one of the most catastrophic handlings of the pandemic on Earth led to one of the worst death tolls and one of the worst economic consequences on the face of the planet, the Tory response was completely consistent with that history. On the one hand, a £25 billion untargeted bung to big business, but on the other, those nurses who Tory ministers applauded from their doorsteps last year, they're getting a real terms pay cut, whilst universal credit is being slashed, driving hundreds of thousands of already struggling families into poverty. As British billionaires' wealth soared during the pandemic, British workers are set to have lower wages in real terms in 2026 than before the financial crash hit back in 2008. Protecting the wealth and power of those at the top, at the expense of the rest of society, is exactly what the Conservatives have always existed to do. Now, class warfare is traditionally an accusation levied by the Tories against those who seek to more fairly redistribute the wealth created by the hard graft of millions of people. After six years of the post-war Labour government, which established the National Health Service and the welfare state, the 1951 Conservative Manifesto declared, of all impediments, the class war is the worst, accusing Labour of hoping to gain another lease of power by fermenting class hatred and appealing to moods of greed and envy. But the Conservatives have always sought to defend privileged interests. In the 19th century, the Conservatives frequently battled to stop anyone except the privileged from being able to vote. In 1831, the Reform Bill, which would have extended the vote to allow up to one in five adult males to be able to vote in general elections, the Tory reaction was hysterical. According to one Tory MP, the bill was a revolution that will overturn all the natural influence of rank and property. While Lord Salisbury, the future Conservative Prime Minister, later warned that first-rate men will not canvass mobs and mobs will not elect first-class men. When trade unions, which sought to win a bigger slice of the pie for working people, began to grow in strength, the Tories fought back. Tory governments proudly championed the notorious Taft Vale legal judgment of 1901, which made trade unions liable for profits lost in strikes. It would lead the future Tory Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin to declare, the Conservatives can't talk of class warfare, they started it. When the trade unions launched the general strike of 1926, the Conservative government warned of Red Revolution and mobilised the armed forces. When the strike was crushed, the former Conservative Prime Minister Arthur Balfour declared, the general strike has taught the working class more in four years than years of talking could have done. As part of that lesson, mass picketing and strikes in support of other workers were all banned, and trade union financial support for Labour was weakened. Fast forward. Margaret Thatcher's mentor was a Conservative politician named Keith Joseph. In 1974, he declared that a high and rising proportion of children are being born to mothers least fitted to bring children into the world and to bring them up. They are born to mothers who were first pregnant in adolescence, in social classes four and five. Some are of low intelligence, most of low educational attainment. His killer line was this, the balance of our population, our human stock is threatened. His message was clear and uncompromising. The poor were breeding too fast and threatened to overwhelm everybody else. These were prejudices widely shared by conservative politicians, but most had the good sense to keep quiet about it. 
Thatcher was the daughter of a small businessman and married a big wealthy businessman named Dennis Thatcher who believed that trade unions should be banned altogether. She surrounded herself with privileged men. In her first cabinet, 88% of ministers were privately educated, 71% were company directors and 14% were large landowners. One of the cabinet ministers told a journalist shortly before the 1979 general election that she regards the working class as idle, deceitful, inferior and bloody minded. Now Margaret Thatcher wanted us to stop thinking about class altogether. Class is a communist concept, she once wrote. It groups people as bundles and sets them against one another. If we were to think about social class after all, then we would start to ask ourselves, why is wealth and power concentrated in the hands of some, but not others? It also encourages us to think about how we can collectively organize with those who share our interests in order to win a better lot of life for all of us, rather than simply seeing ourselves as individuals who sink or swim. That's why the conservatives sought to stop us thinking about class altogether. It's not the existence of classes that threatens the unity of the nation, declared an official conservative document in 1976, but the existence of class feeling. For Thatcher, social problems were not caused by the unjust ways in which society was run, but poverty and unemployment were actually the consequences of individual failings. Nowadays, there really is no primary poverty left in this country, she once declared, adding, all right, there may be poverty because they don't know how to budget, don't know how to spend their earnings, but now you are left with the really hard, fundamental, character, personality defect. When millions of people lost their jobs because of Thatcherite economics, her key ally Norman Tebbit declared that back in the 1930s, his father got on his bike and looked for work. That caused get on your bike to become almost a national cliche, which blamed unemployment on a lack of effort and graft on the part of the unemployed. No wonder then that the conservative newspaper editor Peregrine Worsthorne declared, new Tories make no bones about it. We are class warriors and we expect to be victorious. The government's economic measures caused widespread economic devastation to jobs and to communities, but they also played a decisive role in smashing the trade unions. That is not a conspiracy theory. Sir Alan Budd is the Treasury's former chief economist. Now, my worry is as follows, that there may have been people making the actual policy decisions or people behind them or people behind them who never believed for a moment that this was the correct way to bring down inflation. They did, however, see that it would be a very, very good way to raise unemployment. And raising unemployment was an extremely desirable way of, of reducing the strength of the working classes, if you like. When the miners, who had brought down the Conservative government of the 1970s, were crushed in the middle of the 1980s, the organised working class seemed comprehensively and permanently defeated. What were the consequences of this very British class war? While the wealthy boomed, the real income of the poorest tenth fell by nearly a fifth after housing costs. This was class war. It was a mission which David Cameron and George Osborne proudly continued. According to the former Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg, either Cameron or Osborne once told him, I don't understand why you keep going on about the need for social housing. It just creates Labour voters. This was a government which presided over a doubling of the fortunes of the richest 1,000 Britons, whilst at the same time, the longest squeeze in wages for workers since the Napoleonic War. Boris Johnson is no exception. He once wrote that British blue-collar men were probably drunk, criminal, aimless, feckless and hopeless, and perhaps claiming to suffer from low esteem. His own government carries the old Tory warfare flame burning bright, handing bung to the big business while slashing the real wages of the very key worker who kept Britain afloat during our worst national emergency since World War II. 
And that's why the real debate shouldn't be how big or small the state should be, but whose interests should the state serve? For the Tories, the answer is the same throughout history, that the state should exist to represent and champion the interests of the wealthy and the privileged. That is who the Tories are. That is who the Tories have always been. And until we understand that, we will never be able to build a society free of injustice.